As you know, only Luke wrote a sequel to his gospel. That's the Acts of the Apostles. And that's what we have been reading throughout this Easter season. Our first reading, instead of coming from the Old Testament, will be from the Acts of the Apostles. But what John does in this last chapter of his gospel, he gives us the blueprint, the foundation of this church that grew and we hear about in the Acts of the Apostles. What's the structure of this church? What's the mission and purpose of this church? And what we find here in this gospel, most of those elements. Number one, this community of faithful disciples, followers, need to be a community of prayer, meaning that they are in dialogue with Jesus Christ. That's why we have the dialogue with Jesus while he's still on the shore and they're still in the boat. We have the dialogue when they get on shore and having breakfast, and then we have that dialogue with Peter. Because this church that Jesus wants to establish is not just run by human beings. It is his church. And as his followers, we're called to obey him. Obedience is an element of this dialogue. This dialogue, this conversation is not between two equal parties. One of those parties is Jesus who conquered sin and death and rose triumphant the one who came to show us the way to heaven and to eternal life and makes that possible for us. He wants to make sure that we get there and we only can get there if we listen to him, if we obey him. Again, let's look at the story. You have a group of fishermen. Most of them were fishermen. They've been fishing all night long. They haven't caught anything. They're just a few hundred yards away from the shore, and this stranger on the shore tells them, drop your nets. Now, I don't know if any of you are fishermen or fisherwomen. Fishermen or women, they don't like to be told how to fish, especially if they haven't caught anything. And there's the stranger telling them to drop their nets when the water is shallow. That doesn't make sense. But they obey. And their nets come out full of fish. We're told 153 fish. That's because at that time they believed there's only 153 types of fish. It means everyone, must, we, they must bring to the Lord. Then we hear that Peter jumped into the water. So we have this community of disciples who needs to be in prayer with Jesus, but listening to him, obeying his words. And then... The way they bring people to him is through baptism. Jumping in the water, Jesus wants his church to start this journey of people towards him, towards the shore, through this graces of baptism. Because again, it's a relationship. We can't do the work that Jesus wants us to do on our own nor he wants to do it for us without us. God sees us as his children. We share in the ministry and mission of Christ. We work together. So Jesus, Peter jumps into the water to go to Jesus. Then although Jesus had fished there, but he tells, tells him, bring me some of the fish you caught. Again, that relationship. Both parties have to contribute for this relationship to work, to grow, and to be fruitful. Having that meal, sharing a meal, is it reminds us of the grace of the Eucharist when we come even today to share a meal together and with the Lord. A meal that gives us not just bodily, you know, strength and nutrition, but gives us the graces, God's power to become like those disciples became as we hear in that Acts of the Apostles reading. To stand boldly and proclaim that Jesus, who was crucified, rose from the dead, to defy human authority who tell them, never speak of this na gay name again. And Peter responds, are we supposed to listen to you over listening and obeying God? And they keep proclaiming the name of Jesus, despite the lashes they get, despite being thrown in jail. We cannot become like them on our own. We need the help of God, the grace of God through the sacraments. That's how God helps us to become 
truly his children and live as his children with the freedom, the freedom that Jesus obtained for us. Another aspect of this church is the dialogue between Jesus and Peter. The reason Jesus asked Peter three times is because, remember, Peter denied him three times. The reason John mentions a charcoal fire, the only other time where a charcoal fire is mentioned in the gospel is when people are gathered outside the house of the high priest when Jesus is being interrogated and Peter comes to join him, and that's where he denies Jesus three times. He needs to reconcile Peter to him. Yes, Jesus already forgave him, but Peter has to realize that he has been forgiven. And that's why Jesus asks him three times, not are you going to start obeying me from now on. He tells him, do you love me? This church that Jesus found, wants to find and founded, is not based on rules and obedience only. Before the rules and obedience, there has to be that love. The obedience comes from the love that we have for Christ, comes from I'm trusting in Jesus that he knows what's best for us. That's why we obey him. It's not blind faith. It's based on the love we have for the Lord who gave his life for us. And that's why the one who always recognized Jesus, whether on Easter Sunday when they see the empty tomb, the disciple whom Jesus loved, he's the one who recognizes Jesus on the shore and tells Peter, it is the Lord. Love has to come first. And that love will grow and mature and bear fruit in obedience to the words of Jesus. The words that he speaks to us in the Gospels, the word he speaks to us when we take time to pray with him and listen to him. And as we continue to receive the graces of the sacraments, baptism, first communion, and then reconciliation as he and Peter go through that dialogue. Do you love me? Because without that love, it doesn't mean anything. Without that love, we're like, why should I obey Jesus? I've never seen Jesus. I don't agree with the Jesus. But when there is love, and we know that from our own human experience, our own human relationship, whether with our spouses, with our children, with our parents, with our friends, when there is love, we're willing to do more than when we think we want to do or can do. That's the power that Jesus gives us. He rose from the dead because of his love for his Father that led them to obey even unto death, and his love for us so he can save us and open the gates of heaven to each one of us. So now I want you to think about these disciples, pretend that you're one with them, and go all the way back to when Jesus called Simon, Peter, James, and John the first time. And it's remember, it's a similar story. They were fishing, they didn't catch anything. Jesus comes walking on the shore and he tells them, come and follow me. And we're told they did. They left their boats. James and John left their father and followed Jesus. Did they become his disciples at that moment? What about later on as James and John were fighting who's going to sit on his right and his left when the other disciples became jealous? What about when they abandoned him on Good Friday and Peter denied him? Were they still his disciples? Whatever, whatever, even after the resurrection, when the woman told them the tomb was empty and they didn't believe him, when he appeared to them and they were behind locked doors, afraid, when he said, peace be with you, and yet he comes later, a week later, and they're still behind locked doors, afraid. And Thomas say, I won't believe until I put my finger into his wounds. Were then were they still his disciples? And then we hear about him through the Acts of the Apostles, the great works that they were able to do, their courage to stand up and proclaim Jesus is Lord. You know, the journey of discipleship is not a one-time thing, conversion. It's a journey. It has its ups and downs. 
And yes, they followed Jesus, but a lot of times they disagreed with Jesus. They didn't want him to go to Jerusalem, but yet they continued to follow. They abandoned him. They didn't believe that he's going to die and rise from the dead. But they continued to be together and follow him. Till they became what Jesus wants each one of us to become, a missionary disciple. A missionary disciple is the one who has encountered Jesus in their own life and has a story to tell to the world. How is Jesus in your own life? And when you have the courage to stand in front of others and share that story with them, that's when we become missionary disciples. Disciples of love who out of the love are willing to, today maybe will experience ridicule if we talk about Jesus, experience alienation from members of our family or friends or society in general. But it doesn't matter because love is stronger than anything. Love will make us those bold witnesses of Jesus and be his missionary disciples. That's where Jesus wants us to follow him. And he keeps walking with us along the way to strengthen us, to forgive us, to pick us up when we fall, as long as we're willing to continue this journey and walk with him, we are on the way to salvation. And when we become those missionary disciples, that's how we know that we are on the right way, the way of Jesus, the way of love. That's my vision for Holy Family as a community. It's for us to continue on our journey that we all started, and we all are different parts of this journey as disciples. All of us here are disciples of Jesus Christ, or why would you be here? But have we become missionary disciples? Do we go out every Sunday after Mass and share our faith, share how Jesus is present in our lives, how we experienced him during the week, how we come to know him, in the breaking of the bread that we share at every Mass. Through God's help and guidance through our prayers together, we want to continue this journey so that one day, that's what Holy Family is known for. It's a community of missionary disciples.